I wanted to welcome you to the Japanese American National Museum's Tateuchi Democracy Forum. My name is Dina Furumoto. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator, and we're very excited for our wonderful guest speakers. Let me just give a little bit of bio before we start of them. So Kristen Hayashi is the Collections Manager at the Japanese American National Museum, where she oversees the permanent collection. She is also a PhD candidate in history at the University of California, Riverside, where she is currently engaged in the study of public history, Asian American studies, and the history of Los Angeles. Sorry, there's multiple lists to that. Um, her dissertation research examines the return and resettlement of Japanese Americans in post-World War II Los Angeles. She's a public historian who has worked on museum exhibitions and historic preservation advocacy at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, and through her extracurricular curricular work with the Little Tokyo Historical Society and Historical Society of Southern California. She grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, just as her mother and grandmother did. Her family history has sparked her interest in history and career in museums and public history. And second of all, we have Brian Nia, who is the contact content director at Densho. Brian is a graduate of Harvey Mudd and holds an MA in Asian American Studies from UCLA. His professional life has been dedicated to Japanese American public history and information management. Having held various positions with the UCLA Asian American Studies Center, the Japanese American National Museum, and the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii that have involved managing collections, curating exhibitions, developing public programs, and producing videos, books, and websites. Though born and raised in South Bay to parents from Hawaii, he also lived in Honolulu for over 20 years, has moved back to Southern California a year and a half ago. Though it has been over 20 years since he worked over the job for the Japanese American National Museum in an official capacity, he has sometimes uses he sometimes uses we when talking to the museum. So if you could please give one round of applause and welcome to both Kristen and Brian, and I will hand it over to them. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, coming out this afternoon on such a nice day when you could be doing something more interesting. But nonetheless, um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, just I wanted to do just a quick introduction to the topic and the origins of, of this program. Uh, and essentially, what it is is at Densho, we received a grant from the California Civil Liberties Public Education Fund to do some interviews specifically on this what I'm calling post-camp period, period right after uh, the, the people came out of the camps, and specifically the portion of the population who returned to the West Coast directly out of camp, as opposed to going to you know, the Midwest, to the Army, to Japan, to, to other places. Uh, it's, a, it's a largely uh, unstudied uh, subject, and, and Kristen will talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I think what one of the things that got me interested in this project in particular with regard to Densho is that, it, as you may know, Densho, one of the main things we do are these uh, interviews with Japanese Americans about their camp experience. have been doing it for 20-something years. There are now like over 900 interviews in our archive that all stream or downloadable, editable. They're... Um, uh, categorized uh, by subject, so it's it's a great resource for for researchers, students, and so forth. But in in my own research and using this collection, there are so many of these interviews where uh, the focus is narrowly on camp, and there comes a moment in the interview where, like two hours in, the interviewer will say something to the effect of, "Okay, well, you know, we've been at this for a couple of hours, and you know, uh, we've come to the end of the war. Uh, we we should wrap up now. Um, so, uh, you know, let's, you know, what were your involvement in redress, or how, you know, what, how does this relate to events of today? All important topics. But as a researcher, I'm watching these interviews. I'm saying, wait." what are you doing? This person has this incredible post-camp story and you're like skipping over it. So, um, so that was kind of why we wanted to do this, is to maybe do a set of interviews specifically focused on this period uh, and maybe not as much on camp. And I think the other rationale was that where we are today in 2019, 75 years after the fact, that a lot of the people who are alive today 
uh, and able to do good interviews are people who were children in camp. And I think the, the, there's a limited range of things of, not that those experiences aren't important, they are, but there, there are only certain things that you can talk about from that perspective. And talking about once you get to the post-war years, now these kids are you know, teenagers, young adults, and have a broader worldview out of which they can talk. And the other thing that's interesting is that so many of these people in this generation, my, fa my father-in-law being one of them, will tell you that he was born in 1928, so he's like 14 to 16 while he's in camp. And he said he had the greatest time. He had fun with friends and et cetera, you know? And you hear this over and over of people in that age group. But then after camp, coming out of camp, that was the hard part. Uh, and I think we really wanted to explore a little of, of, that, of, of that topic, given that that's the population largely that, that we would be interviewing. So, and then we have also a little bit of an ulterior motive for doing that, or at least I do, which I'll, I'll get to a little later in my presentation. So wh what we'll do it is uh, we'll, each of us will speak for 25 or 30 minutes or so. Kristen will go first, uh, talking about her, her, her uh, PhD dissertation research. She's this far away from, from finishing. So, you know, here, people here at Janum, leave her alone so she can finish. Um, uh, Fat chance, huh? Um, and then I will follow and do a presentation largely based on uh, dental interviews, some that we've done very recently, and I, I see a couple of people that we've just interviewed in the audience today. Um, and, um, and then we'll have ample time for discussion, maybe for you to share some of your stories, questions, and so forth afterwards. So um, we will start with uh, Kristen's presentation. Well, good afternoon. It's it's um, it's really exciting for me to be here today, but I have to say that I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I've been thinking about this talk, which I'm calling Making Home Again, Japanese American Resettlement in Post-World War II Los Angeles, 1945 to 55, for a really long time. I've been thinking and writing about this topic for years, but this is one of the first opportunities for me to um, to share it with a public audience. Um, I've shared this talk with academics and with professors, and I thought that was intimidating. But actually, this is intimidating <laughs> because although you look like a very young audience, um, I know there are a lot of experts in the room and that there are several of you who've lived through this experience. So my intention is not to tell you how you or your family you know, experienced the post-war period. Um, it's more to sort of give you um, just some a summary of, of some of the things that I found in archives. But I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we'll have afterwards. Um, and I hope some of you will share your family's experiences. Um, so I thought I would tell you a little bit about how I came to this topic and then talk about the significance of studying uh, this topic. And then I'll um, share some main takeaways that I've um, sort of formulated over the course of my research and then demonstrate that by kind of walking you through um, my dissertation. So I was actually interested in studying food. That's what I was going to study for my dissertation research. And I happened to be having lunch with Bill Shishima and Hal Kamey and my father and my faculty advisor. And she was asking these three men uh, what topic really hasn't been explored fully. And all three of them mentioned the post-World War II period and how there wasn't enough scholarship on resettlement. And so it's really because of the three of you uh, that I've come to, to really dive deep into this topic. So thank you for, for that. Um, and it's, it's really true. I think that the stories that my grandparents told, along with their silences, um, shaped my understanding of the wartime incarceration and the aftermath. I'd heard bits and pieces of stories that really piqued my curiosity, but they never gave me a full sense of the complete picture. You know, why didn't my great-grandparents return to Pasadena after the war? Why um, did my father's story of, of his family's experience seem so tidy and neat? You know, these, these are questions that I wanted to explore further. Um, so it's, it's safe to say that my family uh, history has really um, shaped my interest. Um, here's my father. So he was two when his family went to, to Minidoka. Um, and they actually resettled fairly early. They left Minidoka and they went to Minneapolis um, in 1943, so pretty early after arriving at Minidoka. And it was because I had a great uncle in Minneapolis who was um, 
working on a PhD in chemistry, and he sponsored the entire family. And so the story that the family has told is that their time in Minneapolis was actually really wonderful because the whole extended family was able to live in a house together and spend this several years together. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, that sounds great, but I think there's probably more to that story. And what surprised me is that I came across their story um, in the archives, actually at the National Archives. Oops. Um, here's a document from my great grandfather, sorry, my grandfather's um, individual, individual evacuee case file. And um, this is a story of resettlement. So my grandfather, Francis uh, Hayashi, he's writing to the War Relocation Authority. And this is once they're in Minneapolis. And he's writing about some very specific things that the family did not receive, uh, their personal belongings that they left in Portland. And they're trying to get shipped out to Minneapolis. And it's this back and forth correspondence, which was pretty lengthy. And he lists the types of things that they're still missing. And they're very mundane, things like Christmas lights and baby blankets and lamps and things that seem easily replaceable. But it made me realize that when you've lost so much, it's those everyday things that mean so much to you, those things that you had before the war. So this is one way that I think I've learned about how my family was impacted by resettlement. So why is it important to study resettlement? Um, as you probably know, there's so much scholarship on the incarceration, um, and there's very little on the subsequent period. Um, the scholarship tends to skip over the early post-war period and, and pick up again um, on the civil rights movement and then on to redress. And I think partly the reason why this topic has been kind of overlooked is also the way that former incarcerees have neglected to talk about their experiences. I think former incarcerees themselves have deliberately been silent on this period of time. And I think the tendency was to say something like, the incarceration was this terrible moment, and then we were successful. And I think we're, we realize that there's a lot that happened in between those two things. Um, but it makes sense that they would sort of talk about it in this way. I think it's a survival mechanism. You know, it's a way to sort of put things, put this terrible moment in the past and then to move on and look towards the future. The federal government didn't help either. Uh, the federal government's recounting of the incarceration and its immediate aftermath grossly oversimplified the story, suggesting that there was this definitive end to struggle um, upon a definite leave from the wartime detention centers. And it was their way of downplaying any negative aspects of their project, right? And also I think um, it was their way of helping um, former incarcerees transition into you know, mainstream society um, after they left camp. So why focus on Los Angeles? Well, Los Angeles, as you probably know, had the largest Japanese American population on the mainland uh, before the war. And so it seems like a really interesting case study, of course, to, to follow up on. And I'll get into a little bit about why Los Angeles was so unique. Um, but uh, so in addition to former incarcerated silences on the topic and also the way the federal government portrayed uh, the experience, I think that um, public history projects like museum exhibitions have sort of also crafted the narrative on resettlement. So this is um, a photograph of an exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And the focus of the exhibition was on the incarceration. It was in commemoration of um, the 75th anniversary of the, of the um, Executive Order 9066. However, they did talk a little bit about resettlement on those two pillars that you sort of see. And um, that's, that was their way of talking about resettlement. So clearly not enough um, on the topic. And then this is um, a photograph from Common Ground, which is our semi-permanent exhibition at, at Janum, just across the plaza here. And, um, you know, the exhibition does such a really comprehensive job of telling the story of the incarceration. Um, and it's really heavy material, right? And so I think when you leave that warrior's room and then you move into the post-war period, um, you know, I think you've been, you've experienced a lot of really heavy history. And so the way that they tell the story, I think, um, also needs some uh, reconsideration because there is a panel on resettlement and there are a couple photographs that talk about the extreme hardships but then it sort of moves on and you see that the vista ahead is a lot of photographs of this moment when Japanese Americans were successful again um, and so I think we you know really need to, to re-examine that exhibition. And of course, photographs also have really um, shaped our understanding of resettlement. This photograph is sort of late. This is 1954. But these are sort of the photographs you see after World War II. And this shapes our understanding, too. Here you have Richard Kaku. Um, and he 
is standing in front of his, his gas station. Um, and you see these girls who are impeccably dressed in beautiful white dresses, and he looks really proud in front of his business that he's restarted. But this is nine years after the West Coast uh, reopened. So a lot happens before this photograph um, is shot, I'm sure. So since you know, former incarcerees deliberately remained silent about their experience uh, in camp and afterwards, I think it was this moment, the Crick hearings in the early 1980s, when um, former incarcerees had the framework to sort of talk about their camp experiences, and they felt um, compelled to do that, right? Um, I think that for the majority of incarcerees, their experience during the war was somewhat similar. Right, for the most part, it, was, it followed a pretty similar narrative of first going, well, first being forcibly removed from their homes, going to a temporary detention center, and then on to one of the 10 um, concentration camps. There was some variation, but essentially that was the narrative. Um, but uh, for the subsequent resettlement experience, there really isn't one narrative that can sum up every single person's experience. It was so varied in terms of what people experienced, and so I think that for a lot of re returnees, former incarcerees, it's really hard for them to really summarize their experience. So I'm hoping that through my work, I'll start to develop frameworks that people can sort of anchor their own stories to. Um, I think when I, as I talk about, you know, former incarcerees being so silent on their experience, and I think that a lot of it had to do with the survival mechanism, but also the way that the government rewarded loyalty. Right? If you, were, if you um, proclaimed your loyalty to the United States, you were rewarded. And uh, so I think that's another reason why many people did not dwell on, this, um, on the hardships and uh, you know, the trauma of the incarceration and aftermath. Instead, they just looked forward. But the problem with these silences on the extreme hardship during this period is that it perpetuates this idea of the model minority, that everyone was successful immediately. And we know that's not the case. So. Um, that is one of my intentions for studying this period, is to sort of trouble that model minority um, idea, because it wasn't true for everyone. And another reason for studying this period is also the relevance to the contemporary moment. I think that because there's been a silence or lack of information on this topic, we don't fully understand um, the consequences, the long-term consequences of the incarceration and its aftermath. And that's why it's so important to study, especially now, when you're hearing these really um, um, you know, insensitive comments about how the Japanese incarceration can be a precedent for what we can do today with other groups of people. Um, so it's important to study the, the long-term consequences. Oh, so this is, uh, this is just an um, indefinite leave uh, questionnaire. And this also has questions, you know, 27 and 28, the infamous questions on here. And so again, it was all about proving loyalty. And if you had proved your loyalty, you were allowed to leave um, the, the 10 concentration camps uh, fairly early on. The war relocation authority never intended for these camps to be permanent. Their idea was to move people you know, through this process, through the camps, and disperse them widely across the United States. Um, so what happens when you were able to prove your loyalty, when you were able to secure employment and housing elsewhere? The government said you could leave. You couldn't return to the West Coast until January of 1945, but you could go further east. Um, so what was life like afterwards, after you left camp? So this is sort of to give you a little bit of context of early resettlement. Um, well, according to Arthur Okusu, who you see here, life after camp looked pretty optimistic, pretty rosy, right? Um, and, and it's partly due to his age. You know, I think he was in high school uh, at, at Jerome, Arkansas, and uh, he had very optimistic thoughts. He thought that once you left um, camp, infinite possibilities existed, right? You could become a doctor, a surgeon, uh, an engineer. You could become successful in agriculture. You could be an artist, you know? And I think it shows that um, the youth had this really optimistic outlook. Um, but it was different depending on your age. This is also um, a page from one of the yearbooks. I think this is from Jerome. And I just thought this was so interesting. So relocation, they're referring to resettlement, life after camp. But the road back to normal living, what does that mean, normal living, right? Um, while the various aspects of the War Relocation Authority's resettlement program appeared to prepare former incarcerees for life afterwards, um, it ultimately really extended the incarceration. The WRA's policy to disperse the population of Japanese Americans across the United States was really a continuation of the state violence that led up to the incarceration, is what I'm um, 
arguing. And it's partly because they didn't prepare people well to leave and to reintegrate into mainstream society. Um, again, they wanted people to go to cities like Cincinnati or Detroit or New York um, or Chicago. And so they put out brochures like this um, that sort of enticed people to go to a city like Cincinnati. They talked about how there weren't housing shortages there, that employment opportunities were plentiful. And they showed these staged photographs of Japanese Americans who had resettled early doing really well. So you might want to go to Cincinnati. Um, but, but these brochures pretty much look the same for every city. They just switched out the name um, and a few of the photographs. But essentially, all of their reasons for enticing people to go were exactly the same. Then they had these resettlement handbooks, sort of like this. Um, and this is actually a very thin booklet, but this is supposed to give you a guide on how to reintegrate into mainstream society. And it was very general, very vague in the language. So this is a, this is a quote. It said things like, there are many resources available to help you, without like, a detailed explanation of what those might be. And sort of giving you advice that if you're cheerful and friendly, then you know, you'll, be, you'll be just fine. You'll make friends and you'll, you'll do well in your employment opportunities. But there's very little information on how you, you know, take those basic steps of securing housing, of securing employment. So people left camp and they moved to these cities and they weren't really prepared, um, as far as I can tell. Um, and social mobility wasn't as easy as these types of guides made it seem. Eventually, um, the West Coast is reopened to Japanese Americans uh, on January 2nd, 1945. So this sort of gets me into um, some of the main takeaways that I've, I've, I've come across. Um, so I'm suggesting that this long history of state violence or discrimination that obstructed the mobility of Japanese immigrants and their, um, their American-born children in the pre-war period and led to the incarceration continued into the post-war period. And what I mean by state violence is the use of legitimate governmental authority um, to cause unnecessary harm to groups of people or, or to individuals. Um, this continues. The same types of discriminatory legislation that was in place before the war is still in place after the war. Um, the same discrimination and prejudice that existed before the war continues. Um, and uh, some other main takeaways are that families were separated during this period, which also sort of hampered their um, abilities to um, resettle easily. Um, and this was due to employment opportunities. Uh, maybe you know the head of household would take a job in the Pacific Northwest, because that's where he found employment, and the family stayed behind in camp. So they were separated um, in that sense. Or maybe some of the older children, the older Nisei went to um, uh, college somewhere in the Midwest and were separated from their families, or maybe it was due to military service or um, the way that family members responded to the loyalty questionnaire. But ultimately, a lot of families were separated, and this really did um, impact their ability to resettle. Um, as I mentioned, the, the WRA, their whole plan was to disperse the population across um, the United States, but um, as they're beginning to close the camps, because they're never meant to be permanent, they start to, to worry about the population that remained in the camp. So in 1945, there are 70,000 people that are still in camp. And the war relocation can't understand. Why don't people want to leave? The West Coast is reopened. They can go anywhere across the United States. Why aren't they leaving? Well, they're not leaving because they don't have something to return to, necessarily. They don't have homes to return to or employment prospects. So a lot of them stayed in camp as long as possible. But the War Relocation Authority is worried. What are they going to do with all these people? So they go against their plan of dispersing the population. And instead, they say, like, OK, well, we're going to send um, people back to the point of origin then. And so for a lot of them, that's Los Angeles. So a lot of people who returned in 1945, um, towards the later half of 1945, really had a hard time um, restarting their lives. So what are they returning to? What is the social climate like in, in Los Angeles? The, as I mentioned, the intense prejudice that existed before the war really accelerated uh, while Japanese Americans were away. And as a result, the same de jure and de facto discrimination that severe, severely limited their upward mobility before the war continued. So Issei were still ineligible for naturalization. The alien land laws were still firmly in place. And racial ha housing covenants were still legal. Um, and of course, prejudice and discrimination con continued to stifle social mobility. And this time, though, the upheaval from the incarceration as well as the continuing discrimination really dismantled um, Japanese-American livelihoods. And it made it really hard for them to start over again. 
Um, in addition to that, Japanese Americans who returned were facing a completely different landscape. Los Angeles looked physically different uh, than it did when they left. Um, Little Tokyo had become Bronzeville. Um, a lot of African Americans from the South had come up to work in the war industry here in, in Los Angeles, so Little Tokyo looked different to them. Um, and a lot of people had come to Los Angeles during World War II, so much bigger city as well. Um, and then during the war, Nativist groups like the Native Sons of the Golden West um, became even more active in lobbying uh, elected officials to take harsher um, steps in, in limiting the social mobility of Japanese Americans. Many wanted to prevent uh, Japanese Americans from returning, even though they didn't know if they would ever return. Um, they also proposed really outrageous things like um, taking away citizenship from, from American-born Nisei, which we know would have violated the, the Constitution. But they were very active, and they'd send letters like this one to Governor Earl Warren, sort of um, expressing uh, their opposition to having Japanese return. And there's dozens of these letters uh, in his papers at the, at the state archives. Um, same thing with um, elected officials. It was sort of confusing, I'm sure, to, under to know whether these elected officials were trustworthy and if they really did want Japanese Americans back. People like um, Governor Earl Warren and also uh, Mayor Fletcher Bowen here in Los Angeles were, were for um, the forced removal and incarceration at the beginning of the war. And something causes them to pivot during the middle of the war. And you see like Mayor Bowen and uh, Governor Warren actually welcoming people back to Los Angeles in 45. And so it's very confusing, I'm sure. And I'm sure that was the experience of many who returned to Los Angeles. You didn't know who to trust or how people felt about you, which I'm sure was, was very daunting. Housing is, is another way that we can see um, this continuation of, of state violence and discrimination. Um, there's a acute housing shortage in Los Angeles, and it really peaked during the war. Um, and so as people are returning, either Japanese Americans are returning or military personnel are returning to Los Angeles, they have a really hard time uh, finding housing. Um, and of course, the, there was discrimination that intended to limit social mobility um, through the alien land laws and uh, other discriminatory housing practices. So. The boundaries of redlining, for example, though seemingly invisible, replaced the barbed wire that formerly you know, confined Japanese Americans. They still couldn't live where they wanted to or find housing um, very easily. Um, but there were some cases uh, of, of families who were able to return to their homes. This is the Bond family. They lived in Boyle Heights before the war. And Reverend Bond's um, seminary students watched their home during the war. So they were, they were able to return. Um, and they opened up their house as a hostel uh, to returnees who weren't able to find housing. Um, but there's so many others who were unable to return to their homes, like the Kunitomi family. They came home and their house had been raised uh, during um, the war. Um, the Uchida family in Pasadena, um, they uh, were renting out their, their family home and, uh, and gave notice to the tenants that they were coming back and wanted to return to their home. And, um, and the family that was renting the home refused to leave. And this was covered in a lot of the California newspapers. And it was sort of like pitting this Japanese American family against a Mexican American family. Um, and it was really interesting how that played out. But um, those types of things happened where families couldn't return to the homes they thought they could return to very easily. So if you were unable to return to your home, you had to find another option. So a hostel might be an option, um, or a hotel. I see Bill Shishima here, and his family had a, operated a hotel in the Skid Row area, and that probably could have been an, a short-term option um, for, for returnees. Um, but hostels uh, served as like a short-term um, housing option. Uh, the idea was that your housing costs were low, and it was meant to be a short-term stay, but in the process, you were supposed to be looking for permanent housing and also um, employment. Um, but there were hostels all over Southern California, mainly operated by people like the American Friends or religious uh, organizations. Um, and so you'd pay a dollar, dollar fifty a day for room and board. But again, the idea was that you were looking for more permanent housing. For others, trailer installations uh, were the option. So because of the acute housing shortage, the WRA um, uh, had to petition to the War Department to provide um, housing for returnees, and so they did this in the form of trailer installations. And so there were six trailer installations across um, the greater Los Angeles, Southern California area. So Lomita and Hawthorne and El Segundo, um, 
and uh, there were two, Santa Monica and then two in Burbank. So there were Japanese Americans at all of these six installations and eventually, because of all the other pressures on housing, the WRA and the Federal Public, Hou Public Housing Authority decided they were gonna consolidate um, Japanese Americans into one camp. So Winona up in Burbank was going to be the camp that was gonna be for all of these Japanese Americans. So it was this continuous upheaval that uh, sort of mimicked the forced removal and the incarceration and really their accommodations didn't look too far different from um, what they were living in during World War II. Um, if you've ever been to uh, the Burbank Airport and parked in the long-term parking, that's the site of the Winona camp in Burbank. Uh, so this is an article that talks about that upheaval. When they were moving um, the residents to Winona, Winona was not ready yet to accept all of these residents. And so they didn't have um, some of the utilities that were necessary for daily living. And so there were these scathing articles um, against the War Relocation Authority. Why are you sending people here when they're not ready to receive them? So again, lots of upheaval that I'm sure was very traumatic. Um, one of my chapters is on public assistance. And I think this is a topic that probably seems a little bit shocking, and maybe not, because you know when you didn't have much to restart your life with, you would need some form of assistance. Um, so this is a memo that talks about some uh, individual cases that needed assistance. In all three of these cases, they're either Issei couples or Issei widows who are either too old, or too elderly, or too sick to work. And so they would normally be dependent on their adult children, um, but each of them has an adult son who's still incarcerated at Tule Lake in 1945. And so therefore, their adult son cannot help them. And the war reloc sorry, this is, yeah, the War Relocation Authority first says, well, if they weren't dependent on their sons before the war, because they were working, then we can't really give them assistance just because their sons are still incarcerated um, in Tule Lake. So the State Department of Social Welfare gets involved, and they're trying to find other ways that they can provide um, some kind of uh, welfare assistance to these couples. And so that's what this meant excuse me, this memo is all about. And so while these federal agencies are trying to provide assistance, um, it's very short term. It's not meant to provide some kind of long-term plan for them. Um, and so it's, you know, to me, again, this is a, an example of the state violence that continued um, to really um, um, prevent people from uh, social mobility, really. Um, I'm also, you know, really interested in, you know, what happens to Issei bachelors who never married and didn't have family um, to support themselves after the war, and they were too elderly or too sick. Um, this this individual is is at Winona, but there was a, a group of Issei bachelors um, who first went to one of the trailer installations, and then they were sent to Rancho Los Amigos, which was the county a county health facility um, in Downey, um, and that's where they lived out. I think the end of their lives. They're very hard to trace after a few years, so I'm guessing that many of them didn't live too much longer. But once the War Relocation Authority dissolves, then it becomes um, the responsibility of the state or the county or local government agencies to help. Um, so, you know, ultimately, the incarceration produced new welfare recipients that were never um, dependent on government assistance before. So that's another long-term consequence. Um, in terms of employment, you know, gardeners and domestics and seamstresses were often the types of occupations that were open to, to Japanese Americans after the war. And you see that through um, employment ads like this. This is from the Rafa Shimpo. And it's pretty common when you see all these job ads, they are for those, essentially those three occupations. Um, so it didn't matter if you had a college degree or you had experience or maybe owned your own business before the war. These were the types of, um, I think, opportunities that were most common. And employment and housing were inextricably tied to one another. Um, Again, you're supposed if you were living in a hostel or in a trailer installation, you were supposed to prove that you were looking for employment. But a lot of Issei couples were turning down employment offers that they were receiving, and it's partly because they felt that if they left the trailer installations and maybe the job didn't work out, then they would be without a home. So they felt it would be more secure if they stayed in the trailer installation and took odd jobs that were closer to the trailer installation. So the War Relocation Authority is worried about this too. How do we get them to, to transition and move along?
Um, so by 1946, various sources report that about 25,000 uh, Japanese Americans had returned to Los Angeles. And so we're getting pretty close to the number um, of Japanese Americans who were here before World War II. I think before World War II, Los Angeles County had about 36,000. And then by 1948, um, about uh, 28,000 had returned to Los Angeles. And this number increases as the years go by. Um, people who resettled early in Midwest or East, Eastern cities, many of them did eventually return to the West Coast. Um, so I know this is sort of a bit of sort of dismal <laughs> um, picture, but I think that when you look at the community as a whole, um, the community did reestablish itself. And it's partly due to the community, you know, as these um, s federal, state, and local government um, uh, aid starts to dry up, it's the community itself that really uplifts returnees and um, uh, to help them kind of restart their lives. So community organizations provide assistance, um, and I think families, individual families, and neighbors helped individual families and neighbors. Um, I, I interviewed uh, this one um, family member from the Yanai family, and she, her family was a subject of a War Relocation Authority memo. They were very concerned about the Yanai family because it was um, this young couple who had uh, four children under the age of five, and they were having trouble finding employment or housing. But the way that the oldest daughter remembers her family's experience, she knew that they didn't have a lot of money, but she said that what little that they did have, they would help their, their friends, the Takakis, um, who had even less than they did. So I think it's those types of stories of uplifting each other that really, um, helped to reestablish the community. So just as a final thing, you can see that I had a finite number of images to show you, and it's sort of a plug um, for both of our organizations. I think there's probably still so much more information in people's homes and garages. And uh, so if you have photographs or documents or objects like from this resettlement period, I urge you to, to talk to us, because um, I think this is a part of the Japanese American experience that really needs to be fully uh, flushed out, and, uh, and these objects you know, would really enrich our collections. Uh, both of our organizations. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Brian now. Um, just want to preface my presentation by kind of reiterating, uh, you know, one of the points Kristen made is that I've done a lot of research on this topic, obviously, but, you know, at some level, you are the experts that I didn't live through this period, although many people think I did. Um, <laughs> even, if, even when I worked at the museum, like, 25 years ago, I would get an occasional person would, who would ask me, hey, what camp were you in? <laughs> so I just started, like, naming random camps. And, you know. um, now, you know, it's almost believable. Uh, watch it. Um, Anyway, um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's one limitation. I think the other limitation um, is, and I uh, alluded to that earlier, is that these are drawing on interview clips from Densho's archive, and it's largely uh, a Nisei group. So a lot of the Issei story is not gonna be, is not gonna be in this presentation just because those resources just don't exist in our collection. Uh, and you know, I, I think that, that, that's, uh, uh, that's something that we need to find more of these accounts. There, there were some oral histories that were done with Issei at UCLA. Some of those are being restored now. There are some other projects, so I think we're, we're trying to recover some of that, that information. Um, so anyway, um, what, I, what I was going to do was to just kind of go over some of the recurring themes that come out both in interviews and in some of the contemporaneous accounts that I looked at. Uh, and it really is focusing on uh, the first year or two or three after coming out of camp, so 45 to 47, 48, something like that. Uh, and it's sort of, in some ways, it's chapter one of a larger study of this, this reestablishment, this return period, uh, kind of the, 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 the difficult period, I suppose. And it's kind of divided in some, uh, between experiences in rural areas and experiences in urban areas. And in, in our case, it's, I'll specifically be talking about LA and um, go over some of the same themes that, that Kristen mentions. Um, um, and the focus here is really on those who return to California. So this, is, this begins, as Kristen mentions, at the beginning of 1945. 
Uh, so in, in, in rural areas, one of the key distinctions is really between those who owned land before the war and in some ways were able to have something to go back to versus the many who leased land. And basically the people who leased farms, the vast majority of them lost whatever uh, interest they had in those, in those farms. Um, you, you see over the 20 year period from 1940 to 1960, about 40% of Japanese Americans were in farming in 1940, it goes down to like 20% in 1960. There's a dramatic move away from agriculture uh, over that time period. And uh, I wanted to start with this one clip from Mrs. Nita uh, in Florin. And it's kind of you know a happy story in the sense that her family was one of those whose farms were watched over by a man named Bob Fletcher, who's become kind of well known as someone who looked after farms of Japanese Americans in Florence. So can we roll the clip? And then August, we came home. And uh, uh, the Okamoto's came home. You know, we came home the same train. And uh, Bob Fletcher came after us. And. Uh, it was nice to be be home, but you know, they cooked for us and everything, so I was kind of spoiled, I think. <laughs> and I think um, mom and papa went to work for Bob because, uh, you know, he had to finish off 1945. And then we got our land back. I mean, it's probably back in 1946, but then so that's kind of, you, you do hear stories like this where families were able to make those types of arrangements of who owned farms. Uh, Valerie Matsumoto in her research on Cortez talks about uh, they established this land company uh, that people, uh, that white friends behind could, could manage the farms and they were able to return. So there were people who were able to do that. But even among those uh, who are owners, um, the stories often are, uh, difficult ones, uh, as uh, Mr. Na Nakata um, Nakata describes. Yeah, we were one of the first first families back in California. That's why the prejudice was really there. Mm -hmm. We went to our farm, Azusa, California, and that's where. Well, I told you about the prejudice there. But also, I, you know, we said the, the banker is supposed to take care of the house and everything, manage it, but they didn't do a very good job because the house, the windows were all broken, the furniture was all stolen, so we had to replace it all. And so that part was pretty hard on my parents, I think. And uh, so that part was not too good. So you hear lots of stories like that of people who managed to retain property but came back to find it in disarray, basically, right? Uh, one, I don't have a clip for this, but one other thing that happened uh, for farm owners was that during the war, the state of California actually ramps up enforcement of the alien land laws. Uh, they designate funds to prosecute alien land law cases during the war while people are away at camp and can't defend themselves. So there's a series of cases that take place, 44, 45, where uh, basically they're suing absent Japanese American owners for violating the alien land laws, and many of them are forced to what they call quiet title. Basically, they have to pay sums of money to retain ownership of land that they already owned. Um, so this, this occurs during the war. It's this, I, I find it puzzling, but it, uh, there was this ramp up of anti-Japanese agitation during the war when Japanese Americans were all gone. Uh, and it was this effort to, to discourage Japanese Americans from returning. For many who leased and had uh, farm lease land, when they came back, they had nowhere to return to. And you hear many stories like uh, Bacon Sakatani's um, Actually, uh, we had no place to stay. Uh, and so my father got an army squad tent, which is, I don't know, a very small, 12 feet by 12 feet or something like that. And uh, he put it up in the backyard of our former uh, landlord, right across the street from where we used to live. <laughs> 
And I guess my father, I don't know, was trying to get our farm back, or we had our stuff uh, stored in the shed. Uh, they were all gone. And I don't remember hardly anything about living in that tent. I think that just got blocked out of my mind. I tried to get some information from my from my brother and sister, but they don't remember hardly anything at all. But boy, I'm telling you, uh, we lived in that tent. I don't know how we survived. You know, we had to go bathroom and cook and eat and. After camp, uh, so far as I'm concerned, as my interpretation of what happened, uh, <clears throat> uh, was the worst part of my experience. So, and you do hear this from that generation that this post-camp period was in some ways worse than camp. Um, now, one other thing that you see um, starting in 1945 as people start returning, and it particularly, for whatever reason, it mainly occurs in rural areas, were these incidents of kind of what you would call terrorism today. Um, and uh, it happened some in urban areas, but it was much more prevalent for whatever reason in, in the rural areas. And uh, uh, Mrs. Uzaki has a story about that. We came home. We came home. The Sorensons uh, said, come on home. We'll just really give back your farm. Uh, we came home in May and we started to go church. We weren't uh, welcomed as, uh, and, but we kept on going. And I think it was in around February. I can't remember the time. Um, there were some shots fired into our home. Um, my sister was, it was around midnight. My sister was still up. She was sitting on one side, and the bullet hit the chair on the other side across the table. But uh, we were all okay. Yeah. And I understand they think it's the same people that went to Selma. That's what, about 10 miles east of uh, Carruthers, and they shot into the home there, and it hit the baby bed. Everybody was okay, but uh, so there were incidents like that. Uh, so yeah, in the early part of 45, there were dozens of those kinds of shooting, arson-type incidents, uh, it, particularly, as I mentioned, in, in rural parts in San Joaquin Valley, Central California. Uh, amazingly, no one was killed. Um, uh, and you start to see that sort of taper off uh, towards the end of 1945. Um, there was some enforcement uh, of law and prosecution of perpetrators when they were caught. But, um, but yeah, this, this was something that returnees had to deal with, and to a lesser extent in, in some of the urban areas, but not to the extent that you see in the more, more of the rural areas. Um, now, what, I'm going to switch now to talking about Los Angeles. Um, and uh, Kristen referred to this, but people returning to LA were returning to a dramatically different city. Uh, and um, I'll let uh, Mrs. Chikahisa pick that, that storyline up. And I remember more than the, the house was that how Los Angeles had changed in the three years. You know, with all the influx of uh, workers for uh, production and assembly, you know, war, war production, the, the city was, you know, humming with people all kinds of people and traffic was much heavier than I remembered. So it was like it, LA was kind of a sleepy city when we left and we came back it was like a metropolis. 
And you see this in all the West, major West Coast cities. Same thing kind of happens in Seattle, San Francisco, just tremendous growth as war, war, as, uh, war workers come migrate from all over the country for war industry jobs, you know, returning soldiers. And here are Japanese Americans returning from the concentration camps at the end of 1945, facing all this kind of competition for housing, which becomes kind of the, this huge issue, particularly in LA issue in some of the other cities too, but in LA, just from what I'm seeing, that it, it was it was worst uh, in LA. Um, and as Kristen mentioned, you know, hostels were, were one solution, and um, Mrs. Ichino talks about one of the hostels here in, in Little Tokyo. The big question was, where would they live? Because at that time, restrictive covenant was still in effect. And there was still that anti-Japanese feeling. They didn't, they didn't make that distinction yet. And so, where do you put them up? So the Hongaiji Temple uh, and several other temples and churches became hostels. And I remember my dad, I guess, he got worried. He left job, but he came and uh, he stayed at the Hongaiji Temple. And they all, uh, they were down in the basement and in the room, every room was full of these bunk beds, two, three apart. It was hot. Uh, and my dad got a job as a cook or a dishwasher or something just to get started. And I would go there every other day, take his, get his laundry and bring, out, bring back fresh ones for him. And then we would go to eat like at the Chinese restaurant we used to go to, like the Sankoro in the Far East, they were still there. So there, it was nostalgic that something that was we missed was still there. Yeah. So we, I, I look for, I used to look forward to that, and that was my dad and my time. And then. Um you know, the, the hostels were largely community-based um, enterprises, both within the Japanese American community and by supporting organizations. And as Kristen mentioned, you had these whole situations with the trailer parks run by the WRA and the Federal Public Housing Authority. I'm fascinated by this. I'd love to write more on it one of these days if I live long enough. Um, uh, maybe we can, well, compete or collaborate. I don't know which, which. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, but anyway, um, Mr. Wakamiya uh, talks about uh, his experience in living in one of the parks. And uh, when we got off, then we took a red car sh train down to Long Beach, and the Mr. Mizumoto picked us up and took us to our trailer court. Mm -hmm. And that started our uh, few years there in, in the trailer courts. Right. And what was life like in those trailer courts? Uh, uh, pretty confining, because the room was small. 20 you know, feet. 20 feet is not much. And uh, my dad said after he started working as a gardener for a while, he was able to risk, save a little more money. He says, I got extra cash. Why don't we go buy a house? He says, this is awful. So the problem that he faced was a lot of people weren't willing to sell homes to Japanese. So in both of those clips, you also see reference to the restrictive covenants. That even when Japanese Americans were able to raise the capital to be able to buy homes, they were not able to, at least in many parts of the city. Uh, and I think that that's that's a topic. That's another subtopic that really needs more investigation. Is you know when did these barriers start to come down, and you know where could you and could you not buy houses at a, at a particular point in time? So. Um, another area that I think needs more study. Um, the thing I'm struck by with a lot of these trailer park stories is, um, you know, go forward, uh, this is Winona also, uh, but how much the stories are like camp. Um, you know, I, I use this photo a lot just because if you have someone, you know, ask them, what, what is that? They guess it was, you know, Manzanar or something, but no, this is, this is Winona. But the, the, the living situation, 
was almost the same. You know, you, you hear people describe them and it's like, well, they were, you know, you lived in these barracks or trailers and then there was communal mess halls and communal, um, you know, bathrooms. And, you know, when they moved to Winona, the camp wasn't ready yet. And, you know, we tried to get people to leave, but they wouldn't leave. I mean, these are all echoes of the assembly centers and the WRA concentration camps kind of repeated again in these stories of these housing facilities um, uh, that were run by the WRA and the Federal Public Housing Authority. So it's, it's this odd deja vu going on. And then, you know, going forward, you get this whole redevelopment thing and people getting evicted from Little Tokyo and so forth. So yeah, there's this, you know, recurring theme that you get. Um, now, I did an interview with Hal, uh, who I think is here, uh, a couple, a few months ago. And uh, in particular, he lived in uh, the Lomita, what was called Lomita Airstrip at that time. Uh, and um, this is uh, his recollection of that time period. Well, the trailer that we lived in, I can remember, was um, looking at it from the outside. You'd say, what a junky looking trailer. Uh, so I guess they just picked up old leftover trailers. So, uh, but it was our home for a few months, <clears throat> and um, I guess there was a cooking facility. So um, my mother had to cook some food, and uh, <clears throat> to keep food uh, preserved, we had an ice box, uh, an I the old-fashioned ice box. We had electricity for uh, lights or whatever but uh, no refrigerator. And so that meant there was somebody that came, that was the ice man, you know, carrying a big chunk of ice and come in and put it inside of this ice box. And that would last for, I don't know how many days before it melts and then he would come back and replace it again. So we, we had an old fashioned ice box um, to, to keep food uh, preserved. And that's uh, that was our uh, trailer. Uh, no, no toilet facility. So again, we had to walk to some place to wash up or uh, use the toilet. As an aside, we we've done many interviews with Janum volunteers uh, who are great. I mean, they're the they they do they're great at doing these interviews because they're kind of used to talking about the subject, and you know we're greatly indebted to them. And I'm looking at Bill Shishima because he's next. Um, uh, this is this is from an earlier uh, interview we did uh, years ago, um, but. In addition to the issues with, um, with housing were issues with jobs. And in many cases, and in his case, there's a connection between the two, that, that jobs and domestic service types of jobs uh, were popular, one reason being that they also came with housing. Um, and um, Bill talks about how his family gets split up into different places each going to a different place where they have work and housing kind of connected. Okay, uh, since my parents couldn't find a living place for us, we had to go do a schoolboy job. That's that I had to work for my room and board. I worked on a rabbit farm. So my job was to feed and clean the rabbit droppings every morning, then after school, do the same thing again for my room and board. And my brother found a place in Silver Lake District, which at that time was sort of a middle, upper class uh, community. So he, he went to school at Marshall High School. And for his room and board, he had to mow the lawn, wash the dishes, and do household chores. Wow, it's like being an indentured servant. When did you see your parents? I didn't, on, except sometime on weekends, but not very often, because I still had to work on the farm for myself, yes. So you hear a lot of stories like that of, of uh, families, you know, I read one case where one family split up living in like four different places, right? Each mother in one place, father in another place, you know, children in different places. Because uh, that's, you know, they had to live in, in places where they each individually were working for their own room and board. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's kind of this recurring uh, theme. Uh, one of the other recurring things that you see is the importance of particular occupations, domestic service being one, 
But for men, it was gardening. I mean, we know that at some level, that a lot of Japanese-American men became gardeners. Uh, but I was stunned by um, a contemporaneous study by Leonard Bloom and Ruth Reamer. Uh, they write that in 1948 in L.A. County, at least 30% and up to 50% of Japanese-American men were gardeners, right? A third to half uh, were gardeners. So it's just impossible to overstate how big a factor that is. Um, we actually have few interviews with gardeners in our collection. So, you know, one of the things we're looking for is uh, if there are people who you know who can talk about that. We actually, I should say, we actually interview a fair number of people who are gardeners, but we don't interview them about that, right? We interview them about camp and other things. And I think there's two categories. There are people who became gardeners and that becomes what they do for a living for most of their life. And then there are a lot of people who pass through gardening for a short period of time on their way to doing other things. My father-in-law was one of these, right? He, he became a gardener because he had no other options. And gardening was one of the occupations where it was actually advantageous to be Japanese American. He knew nothing about gardening, but he takes out an ad that says Japanese gardener and gets calls <laughs> left and right, right? And he said that he's like killing plants left and right, but you know, he's Japanese, right? It's like, uh, there's something in the blood. Um, <laughs> The, there was one other occupation that was kind of stereotypically Japanese American that we're supposed to be good at. Does anyone know what that, that is? Chick, I was looking for chick sexing, yeah. Uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but there was supposed to be this innate ability and unique Japanese technique for determining the sex of chicks, which back then, Basically, they drowned the males and they, you know, they raised the females because the females were productive. They, they laid eggs. The men, the men were useless. So they needed people to be able to separate the male and the female chicks. And this was a distinct Japanese-American job niche. And people, it was, prim it was not so much a city thing. It was mainly migrant workers in the south and south, southeast and midwest. Uh, but it was a huge source of income for Japanese Americans from the 40s into the, I believe, early 70s. A uh, couple of great books, uh, novels by Cynthia Karohata, uh, The Floating World and Kira Kira, a young adult novel, are set in the world of the Japanese American chick sex. They're both, they're both fabulous books uh, that I recommend you look at. Um, but anyway, um, kind of the last clip kind of is uh, Mary Nomura talking about uh, gardening and domestic work. And she refers to a key. She's talking about her husband, Shai Nomura, in this clip. So. Uh, he went on a, a bus and became a gardener. Used the, the, the residents' tools, cut their lawn and trimmed whatever. He never gardened in his life. He was a farmer before the war. So say, I mean, so, say word, he took the bus, so he didn't have a, a truck. We had or... no car. We didn't have a car. So I used to take a bus and go housework and take different places and do their either ironing or washing or cleaning a little house or taking care of the little kids. And, and we actually eventually went to live in a home together. He as a gardener, I as a housekeeper, and took a little boy. So uh, I'm going to just, there's a lot of other stuff, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up here so we can have a little discussion. But um, I think one of the things that strikes me about all of these clips is just there's this sense of just uncertainty of, you know, everyone seems to not know where they're going to be tomorrow, next week, next year. You know, there's just this sense of uncertainty. And I think it's just really important to understand that situation that people were in uh, at that time. Uh, you know, we talk also a lot about the parallels between the incarceration and today. But I'm struck in these clips about parallels even between this period and today. Like, right, you know, uh, when Bacon was talking about living in tents, it's like, well, hey, I drove by a bunch of tents to get here today, right? Um, that a lot of these issues with housing, you know, kind of still exist in some ways. So I think there are, there are also parallels with regard to this period. Um, and, and as Kristen mentioned, you know, there, there's this model minority storyline. And I think one of the reasons we neglect this period is because we know what the outcome is. We know that there was Daniel Inoue and Ellison Onizuka and Janum and Gardena and all of this. And we know that's where we ended up. 
But the story of how we got there is is complicated, and you know, uh, and like I said, this is I'm focusing kind of on this very early period. There there are many more stories about the you know what happens when the alien land laws are 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 finally um, invalidated and Issei citizenship and you know the the evacuation claims act. A lot of this stuff happens in the late '40s, uh, but there's a this is the, the this is kind of the beginning of this larger story that I think really bears exploration. Uh, and the ulterior motive, I think I mentioned, is, is that we're continuing to do interviews. We're gonna, we've got to do 30 more in the next year or two. So if you know people who have good stories, good memory, uh, and of course I don't mean good and, uh, and happy, but good in the sense of, of sharp, um, from this period, please, please let me know. Um, uh, and it, you know, it, it's a good opportunity for your family story to be kind of, you know, archived and collected. Also, uh, particular, you know, looking for stories of gardeners, of domestic workers, of people who lived in these trailer parks or housing projects, but other kinds of stories too. I mean, I think at this point, everybody has an interesting story, and I think it's more people who are have are good at telling it is is. Um, you know, the main thing we're looking for at this point. So, so anyway, um, I guess we're gonna, we can do some discussion, some Q and A, so um, thank you. So, yeah, if, if there are questions or comments, if anyone wants to, you know, tell their story, uh, we have another microphone that we can also take up to. And from where we sit, we can't see a thing because the lights are shining in our face, so. <laughs> Oh, yes, I just had a question about the map um, showing the dispersal after <clears throat> 1945. And I noticed that Chicago, I know it's not, not on, it's in the Midwest, not the West Coast, but had 20,000 people. So I was wondering if you could address that and why that might be the case. Yeah, so Chicago had, I think, the second largest uh, Japanese American population in the during the war and after. Um, so yeah, 20,000, I, I, I don't know why Chicago over some of these other yeah. Midwest cities, um, because the popula Japanese American population in Chicago before the war was not that large. So um, I don't know if Greg Robinson addresses that in his book after camp, but that, that's a really good question. Yeah, I, I don't either. Yeah, I think there's, there's certainly chain migration going on that some people go initially and have a fairly good experience and many follow. And I think the other important thing to note is that of the 20,000, like, I don't know the exact figures, but a, a really substantial number returned to the West Coast in the subsequent years. So the 20,000 is for a very short period of time. A lot of people, once the West Coast opens up, leave Chicago and come back, come back home. Oh. Thank you. I'm curious about the public assistance part of Kristen's um, work because Nihonjin are not quick to say, oh, we were on public assistance. You know, and I think if we, if that was more revealed, there might be some more empathy for people who need public assistance today. So could you, could you tell us as much as you remember about the public assistance part? Sure, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a really important topic to explore. I was sort of nervous about you know, uncovering um, this topic of people who needed welfare, um, but it is important. So public assistance took many forms. Um, it, it could be you know, the subsidized housing, um, at the trailer installations, for example. Um, it could be tools to help gardeners sort of start their businesses, or it could be almost like stipends the more traditional sense of you know welfare that I think we think of, um, that there were these um, sort of like short-term stipends that were given to families who demonstrated need, and there are different forms of classification or like criteria for um, qualifying for uh, public assistance. So like if it was a mother who had several dependents and she couldn't work because she had to care for these young children, she might receive um, a stipend to help with living expenses. And she might also be living um, with her kids in a, in a hostel temporarily. So it took on many forms, but I, I haven't really um, gotten a full sense of how long these grants were given or the welfare was, was given, but um, also community organizations um, within the Japanese American community offered some form of assistance too. And then 
Um, we also know, I don't know if you would consider it welfare or assistance, but like community centers or gardeners, they had um, their type of like loan program. Um, the name escapes me. The Tanamoshi. Tanamoshi, yeah. yeah. Right, right. So, you know, I think maybe that counts too, but I think you're right. That That's a very good point about um, empathy for others today. Yeah, and then I, I would also add that in uh, the, the trailer parks and, and uh, specific projects in LA were unique to LA, but in other cities, in San Francisco, many Japanese Americans lived in larger housing projects in Hunters Point and Richmond. Uh, in Portland, the Vanport project was this huge project that where there were hundreds of Japanese Americans returned to Portland, became known for this tragic flood that killed many people, uh, including many Japanese Americans. So there were similar things that were occurring in other cities. Uh, but yeah, Japanese Americans did live in these kind of public housing projects coming out of camp in many of these places. Oh, Min. One thing you should. Uh, oh, oh. One thinking, when you talk about trailer camp, these are travel trailers, yes. not any kind of large trailer. They're very tiny and very confined, yeah. and they just had a kitchen. And like uh, was said, you had to go to your bathroom or you had to shower outside in a community place. So it, a little bit like camp, just a, bit, a little bit, but, uh, and the rooms were small. Um, I just had another question about the public assistance. So did like the WRA and then maybe even the church groups or, or the other like ass assistance programs refer people to the government assistance? So they would say, oh, you know, you're in such a situation, you should go here? So, or was it that the people just thought themselves, oh, I'm really in need of help, I could go to the, I don't, I don't know what office it would be. But, um, like welfare office. Yeah, I mean, I was just wondering if they were referred there and they went there with a recommendation like, or how. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the War Relocation Authority had field offices in different cities across um, the United States, including Los Angeles, and they were open for a little over a year. Um, and part of it was to provide counseling or to provide resources for returnees, so employment, housing, welfare assistance. Um, but as I've been going through the archives, it's confusing for me. So I'm sure it was extremely confusing for returnees to try to find the, the, the resources that were available to them. Um, but yeah, there were several agencies involved. So the War Relocation Authority was referring people um, to local, um, so county, the county of Los Angeles uh, was involved in providing public assistance, the state of California. Um, and uh, I'm not so sure about the federal level, but um, I guess that would be the WRA. Um, but yeah, so there was like a variety of, I think, assistance that was available, but navigating how you qualified, um, I think is a whole nother story and it seemed very confusing. Uh, you're telling us about the population of uh, well-behaved people. Uh, there were dissenters and people suspected of being spies and it got, that had different treatment during the war and happened to them? I, I'm sure some of them were traumatized. And uh, Are you talking about like Tule Lake in particular yeah, or? Uh, uh, no, that, mm -hmm. that uh, they had other facilities for some of those people and uh, mm -hmm. I mean some had these interrogations and with beatings and everything and residual injuries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, did you get any people like that and their stories? Um, not, well, a lot of these were Issei, uh, for one. If you're think, talking about the people who were in the, the Justice yeah. Department, uh, you know, uh, INS internment facilities, yeah, there's, there's not much in terms of interviews. Um, there are written accounts, uh, uh, contemporaneous written accounts, largely in Japanese, but some have been translated. So there, there, there is some of that. Although, it's the same problem, right? A lot of those uh, accounts sort of end at the war. Uh, and so there's not a lot about what happens after the war. Um, in, in Hawaii, uh, I worked for the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, and we translated uh, a couple of these accounts. And they literally end with the return of the internee to Hawaii, and that's it. And so we really don't, we know very little about the reintegration of, the, of that population. It, it, would be a, it would be a really interesting research topic, but there's, there's not a whole lot. And of course, those people are long gone. Unfortunately. <laughs>
people needed to uh, sign a, uh, an oath uh, afterwards. And I'm wondering, what about the, the no-no boys? And I'm sure there were women uh, along with that. Was there a differentiation in, in terms of where they were relocated and the types of services they had access to? If you could address that. Yeah, I don't know too much about um, people who left, finally left Tule Lake and, and you know, what happens uh, to them, but I, I imagine they would have still qualified for some type of you know, assistance if, if they needed it um, because other Issei did. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't fully answer that, but I think these are two great topics that we need to, to address further because um, you're right, we're only talking about a certain sector of the population and it was those who were eligible um, to resettle fairly you know, early. And I, I, I think I remember reading, and maybe it was um, uh, Tom Sasaki's notes on Winona, that truly late people were overrepresented because they came out even later than other people leaving the other camp. So their housing issues were even more difficult. Uh, but I can't, don't quote me on that, but I, I, I believe that appears, I, I, I have it in my notes somewhere, but I believe uh, that's in, in Sasaki's reports about Winona. And what, which would make sense, right? Because uh, people on Tule Lake are leaving into 1946, so they're going to have even more difficulty. Yeah, just, and you bring up a really good point about Tom Sasaki. Uh, so he was Nisei, and he worked for the War Relocation Authority. And he's going out into the field, and he's interviewing uh, returnees to Los Angeles. And his interviews are, are really candid, I think, and, and give a really good snapshot of what um, it was like for returnees soon after you know, they came back, so in 1945, 46, and he talks with um, like the owners of, of small businesses and, and SROs and gets just a very, again, candid um, account. So that's available, you can find that online and it's, it's worth reading because it's really interesting. In the Densho Encyclopedia, there's an article I wrote on Tom Sasaki and that'll give links to the, to, to the uh, specific documents. It's, it's a little frustrating too because he kind of parachutes into Lo Tokyo for like four months and gives this incredibly detailed account of that four month period and then he leaves. So you don't know what happened before, <laughs> you don't know what happened after, but it's just kind of this fascinating snapshot. Um, another contemporaneous source that, that I think is really um, interesting are the Charles Kikuchi interviews. Uh, he conducts the interviews in Chicago, but many of people are talking about uh, things going on in other parts of the country. So um, yeah, those, and those are also now online. Um, uh, he was a researcher for the Japanese American Evacuation and Resettlement Study, the JARES project, which is a Berkeley research project that put field workers in the camps. Kikuchi was pr uh, particularly, um, uh, what's the word, just prolific. Uh, he, he kept, you know, wrote hundreds, literally thousands of, pa of pages of diaries documenting his time in camp and in the army and in Chicago and does these, you know, interviews that run hundred, over a hundred pages in many cases with like 60 people who resettle in Chicago, but the, they're, they're quite wide ranging. So they give a sense of, you know, contemporaneously what was going on at the time and what people were thinking about. And it's similar, you really, feel the sense of unease and uncertainty that everyone's kind of grappling with. So I have a question. Hi, so, up here. <laughs> Hi, Brian and Krista. Um, so, you know, as I, I've been recently going through the camp newspapers and something that's really struck me is that the sort of the reports of suicide towards the tail end, uh, when people know that they're gonna have to leave. And I, you know, I'm not compiling statistics because I'm looking for something else, but it's really struck me. And it's, it tends to be a lot of bachelor essay. And um, I'm curious, you know, because you've both sort of mentioned in passing this phenomenon of these people who've sort of fallen through the cracks who aren't part of this, the, they're not part of a family. They don't, you know, and many of them may be immigrated alone. They don't have extended family. And even if they don't sort of give up hope while they're still in camp, I, their, their record just kind of peters out. And I wonder um, if you've been able to sort of trace things out a little bit more or sort of compile more data about that. Because I think, again, this idea with, you know, the model minority, we all think about sort of how we've all come here, but there are these 
hundreds, who knows how many of these people who did immigrate went through this whole experience and yet they've just kind of been erased because they they didn't have sort of, you know, extended roots um, beyond themselves. And what, what do we do about those stories and how do we recapture them? Yeah, I think that's an excellent uh, point. That was one thing I really wanted to explore in my research, uh, Issei Bachelors. And um, so I told you about the ones that were sent to Rancho Los Amigos. Um, but I, I came across this really heart-wrenching um, memo in the National Archives where Relocation Authority um, had interviewed this Issei bachelor, and uh, he expressed his interest in working, that he didn't want to go on public assistance. So this was in the public assistance um, case files, and, and he just wanted to work so that he didn't have to go on, on public assistance. And so they were trying to find something, but they were concerned because he was rather elderly and, and couldn't take on manual labor, the types of jobs that were available at the time. Um, and so I don't know what happens to him, but there there's a chronicle of quite a few names. And so I think they probably could be um, researched further. Um, but at least you know the men that I was following that go from trailer installations to Rancho Los Amigos, um, I didn't see them you know, in, in records or documentation uh, a few years after. So I think you bring up a really good point. And there's so many different sectors of the community that need to be explored. Uh, so thank you for that comment. Are there records of Rancho Los Amigos or? Yeah, because Rancho Los Amigos still exists. And I haven't been able to go out there. But um, I'm thinking maybe there, or since it was a county health facility, maybe the county has records. Um, I'm not sure if that type of information is, you know, readily accessible, or if that information gets, you know, deleted after a certain period of time. Yeah, I, I have not attempted to search out, you know, public records on some of these facilities because there, there were county inspectors going to the trailer parks and so on. So, I've not been able to go look for them, but presumably there could be some of that material, maybe. But yeah, to be done. One other thing I want to mention is that the Japanese people had this tremendous pride. Mm -hmm. So they didn't, uh, they just didn't want to go on welfare. Right. They did everything good, and the, and the friends and, and family would try to help mm -hmm. them if they, didn't, if they didn't have a job or couldn't, couldn't work or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there, there were very few people on welfare as far as I can, I can tell. Right, the numbers, you know, aren't large. So it's not that everyone who returned was on a form of, you know, public assistance. But I think it still is important to talk about that, you know, sector of the population because it shows, you know, the consequences of the incarceration. And you know, once you've been crippled economically and your social mobility has been um, hampered, like, you know, how do you move on, right? So, yeah. But you're right; it wasn't an extraordinary large number. I'm just curious as to whether the, the stories that you've given are typical of what happened to Japanese Americans when they came back uh, to Los Angeles and other areas. So I'm one of those who came back. And while our story was not pretty, it wasn't as bad as the ones that you've laid out. So I'm just wondering, is yours typical or did you pick you know, kind of the the bottom 30%. Um, what I tried to do in each of my chapters was sort of give a range of experiences, but today I just sort of presented the ones that, that experienced the most hardship. Of course, there are people who came back and had a relatively easy time reestablishing themselves. They had friends who watched over their homes, and so they were able to move back in, or they were able to restart businesses. But I think overall, for the majority of people, um, it was, like extraordinarily difficult. Um, and it was because there were all these um, obstacles or I think th challenges that were working against them, making it more difficult. Um, but as a whole, you can see that the community really did um, reestablish itself. Um, and I think that does, you know, it's testament to, you know, the returnees themselves, right? And, and I think it's a lot of their values and, and their determination and resilience right, uh, to restart. So again, we're, we're really talking about those first few years when I think it was really difficult. Um, but you're right, it's not everyone. And I did pr portray, <laughs> I think, a certain um, experience today. I'd say the same thing. I mean, I think the overarching themes are similar. But yeah, I did pick the more dramatic stories within those 
those themes for the presentation today. So, and you know, I don't think there is a typical necessarily because I think every everyone's story is very different. But um, you do you do hear these basic themes re repeated over and over to differing degrees, definitely. Uh, you spoke about housing discrimination. What about education discrimination in a higher educational systems like UCLA, USC, and so how, what percentage of people coming back try to apply to these um, institutions got rebuffed and did during this time period these um, Gardner fathers push their children toward this higher education and, and if many of them did, what sort of fields did they gravitate to? Yeah. Um I, I've come across files in my research from universities where there was discrimination and they didn't want to accept, you know, Nisei. Um, but, uh, and, and I'm not exactly sure, like, which one, so I don't want any. <laughs> any. But I also did come across um, uh, some documents about younger children um, who were going to, they're coming back with their families, and from, this is from Tule Lake, and they were um, going to be sent to one of the trailer installations in Burbank. And it was from the Burbank School District uh, that we're saying it in very euphemistic terms, but you know that they couldn't accept these students mid-year, you know. Um, and I think the underlying part was they didn't want these students in their school. I think they could have made an exception, maybe not. But it seemed like there was some, um, there was a lot of discrimination uh, in the undertones of that. So um, I think there certainly was discrimination in terms of education. Um, but uh, one of the, the good stories is uh, Los Angeles Trade Tech, um, which was called the Frank Wiggins Trade School, which is now Los Angeles Trade Tech. Um, but they were very open to Nisei coming and learning a trade. Uh, so I know your father-in-law mentions it in his book. Um, but there was dressmaking and automotive and you know, different trades that you could learn. So that was one place that was very accepting. And, and there were you know, a smattering of other universities that were accepting of Nisei. Um, but I think you're right to point to Issei really instilling in their children the, the importance of getting an education. Um, the GI Bill also helped uh, like returning veterans um, pursue their educations as well. well. I had read somewhere that they found no collusion or evidence of spying from anybody, you know, the ones that were sent as suspicious to Tule Lake and all that. You can say something about that? Are, wait, are you referring to not finding any evidence of spying among Japanese Americans. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's largely true, uh, uh, although um, there were um, five treason cases involving Japanese Americans, although, you know, um, all of them were, um, I mean, one of them was the famous Tokyo Rose case, Aiva Toguri. Uh, one was Tomoyo Kawakita, but they, these were both Nisei who were trapped in Japan during the war. Uh, and there was a famous case of three Nisei sisters in Colorado who were convicted of conspiracy to commit treason for helping, you know, German POWs in Colorado. But that, that's another, these are very anomalous cases. Um, it's true that all those who were, who were uh, basically convicted of crimes for spying for Japan were white, which makes sense because the last person who's going to have the ability to commit any espionage is someone who looks Japanese. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, logically, that's kind of what happened. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there, there's an excellent article by Eric Muller on this, and he wrote an article in the Densho Encyclopedia on that, that, that covers that story, the Shitada sisters. Um, but yeah, Min's right. It was, he concludes that it was largely a, a love triangle situation. This uh, post-camp uh, anti-Japanese feeling, does it come to your mind how much that was related to having uh, occurred in areas where there was high density of Japanese and Japanese Americans, as opposed to where Japanese were sparsely uh, in density? Well, it seemed like in the more rural areas, it was the most vehement. So you might have you know, con small concentrations of Japanese Americans, but it seemed like that's where you get the violence and you get billboards that say you're not welcome. Um, um, but so not necessarily density related? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so, yeah. 
Yeah, because I think in in a lot of those small areas, there was like one family or one person that was able to drum up local opinion, like in Hood River, Oregon, famously, um, and you know, yeah. So it it yeah, it seemed to really vary from place to place, and you know, I mean, in in inland cities, in the, in in the um, you know the Chicago's and the Detroit's and so on. Uh, it, it varied greatly, too. So, yeah, it's hard. I, I don't think it, you can generalize in that respect. But the letters to, like, Governor, Governor Warren, for example, coming from California residents who um, are in opposition to Japanese Americans returning, those come from across the state. Um, rural, urban, it was a wide swath. Thank you. Okay. Um, he just asked about people that lived in... Uh, predominantly Jap like Japanese or Japanese American community. When I went to camp, I went to camp from Florin. Florin was probably 85, 90% Japanese. But when I came back, we also came back to Florin. And uh, I was treated really, we were treated really bad in Florin, you know, because the people there, after we came back, they didn't know any Japanese because they had moved in after we, we were put in camp. So that was a bad experience for me. But when I came back to Lakewood, I was the first Japanese American to come back. And for what happened to me in Florin, don't you think I was very afraid and scared? But when I came back to Lakewood, it was completely different. And it's kind of a long story, so I want to repeat it. I saw one of the person you talked to was of a, a, a woman that Bob Fletcher helped back in, I think, Sacramento, Florin area. But I was more concerned with the farmers that returned to their farms. And uh, because I just finished reading the book by uh, 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 Kiyo's story, and it talks about her returning to the farm, and there's, I don't know if there's squatters or there's people renting her farm, but they have to wait to get those people out there. And the, the people that were on the farm couldn't run the farm, so the, the farm was dilapidated and could not be, it took a while to be brought back up to working stages. How many of your stories at Densho refer, reflect farmers returning to their land that weren't able to farm for a while? Uh, I can't give you a number, but yeah, there there are a number of stories like that. Um, Kiyo Sato's book is excellent, by the way. I uh, highly recommend that. But yeah, no, that you're right. That that's that's something that you see that you see a lot of, definitely. I, I yeah, it it is a recurring storyline also. And you you mentioned that the alien land laws became um, tightened, uh, you know. And in addition to that, I think there was the Lowry Bill. I think it was called the Lowry Bill, which was passed during the war, and that was essentially the government could take away like fallow or unused um, agricultural equipment. So you know, farmers who were now incarcerated obviously weren't using their farming equipment, and the government could take that away um, as part of this bill. So that was just another obstacle uh, to farmers who returned. So I, I just wanted to thank you both for doing what you're doing and doing the research that you're doing. My parents have both passed away. They were both in camp. But uh, they never talked about any of this. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And I'd just like to thank you know, all the people we interviewed, because without them, you know, their willingness to tell their stories is, is really critical. So. Okay, um, so let's give another round of applause for our speakers.